Okay, thanks very much, uh, Matthias, and uh, I'm really pleased to, to be here. Um, it's a different audience for me. It's nice to uh, uh, have a connection uh, to the CTA project and to see some friendly faces. Uh, uh, Matthias, very nice to uh, continue the, the work with you. Thank you very much also for the, uh, the introduction. We touched on a, a few topics. I, that's true, I'm, I work at the, the CDS in Strasbourg in, in France. And I will, I put the, the slides on, onto the escape um, template because most of what I'm going to talk about today concerns things that have happened in the escape project. Uh, but I'll also tell you a little bit at the beginning just uh, about my background and, and a little bit about the CDS. And I should also say that I've, stolen a few slides from uh, colleagues of mine uh, in the escape project, uh, Matthew Servia and Matthias, and as well as uh, my colleague from ESO, uh, Alberto Nicole. And I, I use a lot of liberty to uh, demonstrate things using some of the CDS uh, uh, tools. And uh, so you'll see that as we, as we go along. So yes, so just to, to um, add to the introduction, so I, my background is as an astronomy researcher on, on active galactic nuclei, and I've somehow uh, found my way to working uh, on, in a data center and uh, on open science. Uh, so I'm the director of the CDS, and as Matthias says, we have services that hopefully are well known and used throughout the community, uh, Aladdin, uh, Sinbad, and Vizier. And last year, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the of the CDS. And so I've been contributing also to the IVOA because it di relates directly to sharing data. And we're, I've led the virtual observatory activities in the ESCAPE project. So um, uh, just a couple more words on CDS. It's a, it's a French research infrastructure. I'm going to be using the word research infrastructure a few times. So I sort of thought I'd point out that the one that we have here uh, is a national level research infrastructure at the University of Strasbourg and the CNRS. And we have our reference databases, SIMBAD, which has some 14 million objects in it. We collect catalogs uh, from the published literature. There are some 23,000 of those, 80 billion rows that we, we serve uh, as our role in astrophysics. And we have a visualization tool called Aladdin, which has all sky surveys in it. And that's our fastest growing service. We've got almost uh, half a petabyte of uh, image data in uh, accessible by Aladdin and other services and APIs that serve those tools. And we make them interoperable by standards, by using the standards of the IVOA, that's the International Virtual Observatory Alliance. And this is kind of the link into the work that we do in ESCAPE and uh, in the virtual observatory. Uh, so there's a whole landscape of these type of activities. I mean, this is a CDS-centric view of, of what we do at CDS. We have connections to the, to the infrastructures like the big telescopes and the space missions who have their own archives. We also collaborate with the astronomy data centers like ADS that we all know, as well as NED and Canadian and American data centers. We participate in this activity, which we call virtual observatory. It's a little bit of a, uh, 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 idea that the data that we publish in the electronic services in astronomy kind of make this digital sky of data that we can observe. And so this idea of virtual observatory came out in about 2000 and we've been using that word. We participate in Horizon 2020 projects. You'll hear about Escape. And we also sort of connected to some of the data infrastructures that are out there, like the Research Data Alliance, and in Europe, uh, what we call the European Open Science Cloud. At CDS, we have a kind of special link to the journals in astronomy because we process the data that comes from the, the journals. OK, so. Uh, this, what the CDS does is part of a much bigger uh, enterprise, which we can call open science. 
And if I think of some of the main elements of that, it's about how we share the data. Uh, and we think of that in terms of something being open, you know, there's sort of no barriers to it, it's seamless. It's, it's the idea that we can reuse that research data in a relatively free and easy way, uh, not spending most of our time writing programs or logging into websites or things like that. So that's the idea that things are, are open and seamless. And uh, it's quite well known now to use the, the word fair. And I, I like it a lot because it, it gives us a kind of common language for what we mean about open science and data sharing, that the data should be findable, that it should be accessible, that it should be, you know, kind of usable together, interoperable. And that uh, the whole point of doing that is that we don't, you know, we can reuse a lot of the data that comes from observatories in many ways, not just for the original PI science, but um, for all types of activities. And in astronomy, it's really uh, a common way of working because most of the physics questions that we need to ask today in astronomy need data from multiple telescopes. So we really need to be able to combine data and reuse it. Another aspect of that is that, you know, this doesn't happen automatically. There's a lot of computers involved, of course, there's a lot of technical things, but there's also a very human side to open science. And uh, we, call, we can call ourselves data stewards, because it's the human aspects of uh, being able to you know, provide quality data, to manage the data, to provide those, those services. And so FAIR is this uh, acronym which is uh, being well used everywhere now. And I, I kind of wanted to jump into a, a sort of visual example of FAIR to sort of show what I think it, it means for, for some aspects of astronomy. So if you're interested, for example, in active or interacting galaxies, you probably know about the antennae and uh, NGC 4039 is one of those interacting galaxies. And I, I kind of want to show you an example of FAIR with, uh, with uh, the, the, the antennae galaxy. So, so how is that findable? If you're using a tool like, uh, like the one we provide from the CDS called Aladdin, you can basically type in the name of the object. It gets resolved to an astron astronomical coordinate. It then queries the databases that are in astronomy, and it can tell you where you can find that data. So this application uh, is fairly detailed, and you can see on the uh, on the the left panel, it shows you the data collections, and actually that lights up in green when there's data available for that object in the field of view that you're looking at. And this is an interactive thing. You can zoom in and zoom out, and those colors will change depending on which services are able to give you data on that object. So that's, uh, that's telling you, you know, data that's found, and it's also telling you where it's not found, which is, I find, an extremely useful uh, thing to do. And that's because, Behind those data services that are listed on the left-hand side, there is a kind of indexing, and it's a coverage of those different services on the sky using a, a map like what you see here that allows those services to tell you whether they have data or not at that point in the sky. So that's finding, that's F. Uh, accessible, once you've got, you know, you've found that the data exists, you can, you can access it, you're, you can look at it, you can visualize it, you can download it. So that's the A. So the interoperable, uh, you want to use data not just from one source, but from many. And a tool like Aladdin allows you to pull those data in to register them astrometrically so that they're on the same zoom scale. You can combine them, overlay them, uh, do what you want. And so that's kind of one level of, of interoperability, maybe a fairly simple one, but uh, one that we certainly need in, in astronomy. And it's reusable. So I've shown you Aladdin, but a lot of those services which are available through Aladdin are also available through various uh, application programming interfaces. And you can query them, for example, through Python notebooks. 
So here's just one simplified example where you are using that data that's there, accessing it programmatically in a Python notebook and doing things like making cutouts of the data. So you're reusing them for some other purpose. So, so that's my kind of visual example of, a, of FAIR for astronomy using just one, one object. Now, how do, what makes that possible? How, how does that work? Well, one is the standardization that's behind. For the all sky coverage, we use a system called HIPS that stands for Hierarchical Progressive Surveys. It's based on heel picks. You split up the sky into regions and then you keep on dividing those regions four by four as far as you can go. Um, it's a system on the sky that, that's easier to use than astronomical coordinates. It's uh, a system where you can support this idea that the more you zoom in, the higher resolution images you get or the higher detailed information you get. So that's been standardized in 2017 by the IVOA and we have a, a paper published uh, about that. And this is you know, the technical side of it. What you, you, know, you have a complex table like this that uh, shows you the indexing of those regions on the sky. And, and what's the reason why I show this table is because it sort of illustrates that you can combine all of the different scale data. You know, WMAP images have a resolution of only about seven uh, arc minutes on the sky. But in the same system, you can describe you know, uh, an image from the Hubble Space Telescope using, you know, with 25 milli arc second pixels. So you have this system that allows the description of all those different types of data in the same way that allows a tool like Aladdin to use them all together. So it's standardized with a lot of effort to make kind of agreements at international level about how you do that through the IVOA and you end up with uh, uh, standardized documents like the one for HIPS that's shown there. And that becomes a kind of versatile container Anything that you can describe on the sky, you can make into a HIPS. You can make it for images, you can make it for catalogs, you can make it for density maps or flux maps. You can see the Gaia density map um, on the bottom there. You can see the, um, uh, the footprint uh, of observations there. And because it's actually, because it's a sphere, you can even use it for planetary surfaces. Okay. Uh, and here's my the video I've got for this this uh, slide this um, uh, talk, whereby you know in Escape, for example, we've used the so pathfinder data of uh, for SKA using the <laughs> Meerkat. It's a noise coming through. So. so I think maybe someone needs to mute in the background, but. Um, Okay, so this video was just demonstrating the use of um, the use of uh, that standard where you can deal with the whole sky of data. And the more you zoom in, the more you get. Uh, and it allows you to access those petabytes of, of data that you would not be able to download onto your computer and zoom into. But here you get you are being streamed just the data you need to for what you need to see at a given moment. And people might have noticed that we were changing the stretch on that image. And that's because it uses not just a, a visualization format like JPEG, but it, behind that is the FITS files of that Meerkat image of the center of the galaxy. Uh, uh, and you can actually change the stretch because you're dealing with the real scientific values, not just the, um, not just the visualization. Okay, that indexation of the sky is extended to not just uh, the images like you saw, but also to uh, describing the coverage of a given data set in, in space, like what part of the sky does it cover? But there's an extension to that that we've done, which is based on time. So you can say, you know, what is in what region of the sky observed within a certain time range. And you can use these things to make the intersection between hundreds of surveys 
in space and uh, and time. So that's the I, I just wanted to sort of give the idea of standardization and how it relates to some of the data that we're using on the sky. That's just one aspect of the standardization that's been done at the international level through the IVOA. This is a kind of overview of all of the standards there and the architecture. Um, there are about 50 standards that are approved over the lifetime of the IVOA. And let me just sort of show you what the idea is. I mean, we can split this architecture up into different levels. This is the most simple level where you say, you know, at the top you have your users and at the bottom you have your providers and you want to be able to find that data, get that data, use that data, share it. And this, what happens in the center is basically the what needs to happen in the VO. This is the, the sort of next level of that architecture where you put the language of the virtual observatory onto that diagram. So where you talk about finding, you're talking about the virtual observatory registry. When you're talking about getting, you're talking about the data access protocols. And then everything kind of in the middle are things like the formats, the semantics, the data models, the query languages. And then also around that, there's the, the, the applications, the metadata, the collect, you know, the actual storage and things like that. And then the IVOA has built standards that relate to different areas of that architecture. And so I won't, you know, each blue box here is a, is a standard that relates to some aspect of, um, of that, uh, that architecture. And there's a, a whole process for that. You can access all of the standards uh, through the IVOA. They're published uh, through the ADS. They have DOIs for the standards themselves. And we also list all of those standards in a, in a thing called fair sharing. It's a database for standards across all different areas of, of science. And here's just another idea, you know, aspect of how you, you know, what that enables. You're able to have your applications that can talk to one another based on the standards, the data that's accessible by the standards. And uh, there are a number of tools that support them, uh, not just ones from the CDS, like I've shown at the top, but also others like, like TopCat and, and various uh, libraries for Python notebooks and the like. Okay, so um, uh, those standards aren't much good unless they're actually used. So there's been a, um, a big push, of course, to uh, foster the adoption of standards in research infrastructure. So I'm going to give at first a couple of examples of those. And in fact, uh, you know, the, the request for the, for the presentation in this webinar was, was asking, you know, what, um, what can CTA learn from the experience of implementation of these types of technologies in other infrastructures? So I've tried to highlight now how those standards have been used in different places, and then I'll get on to how we've supported that in escape. So, so here's one nice example. It's ESA Sky. It's from the European um, Space Agency. Uh, they have a data center which has implements virtual observatory standards and they make things accessible through their tool called ESA Sky. It uses the HIPS images that you've just seen, but it uses the other VO standards for tables called Table Access Protocol. It uses queries through the astronomy data query language, and it provides a sort of semantics of the data using a standardized uh, thing called UCD, which is Unified Content Description. So they've taken the approach at ESA to integrate VO fairly deeply into their archives. Even the internal workings of their archives uh, make use of the table access protocol and of the various standards. And then they expose those data models and those, those data uh, through applications and query formats uh, uh, like ESA Sky, but also other programmatic things. So that's one example. Another example is the recent use of uh, some of the virtual observatory standards for uh, gravitational wave follow-up observations and the localizations of those uh, gravitational waves on the sky. So they have applications 
that enable you to visualize using those standards, the, the coverage on the sky where the gravitational wave may have came from, you know, so those are probably probability maps that they display on the sky and they use the VO to manipulate those sky regions and to, to, to do various things uh, for their users. Okay, so that's an example where the VO has kind of been implemented as a layer. You know, they've already got their services working and they're able to provide a kind of VO layer on top of those to, to then interact, to allow interaction through tools like what you see there. Um, okay, so there's been a few ways we've been trying to support the adoption of the VO in Europe. There have been a series of what's called EuroVO projects that have run for you know, some 20 years actually, since 2002. And of course, there's been many evolutions over that time. The most recent project is uh, called ESCAPE. And that is a project which is not just VO. VO is one part of ESCAPE. And that project ran for four years between 2019 and, and January of this year. And that's a big project, which was uh, addressing the open science challenges of many large research infrastructures in astronomy, astroparticle physics, and also in particle physics. So there's the whole set of logos you can see on the, the side there. And in fact, that project came to a conclusion in, in January. Uh, here's uh, you know, the logos again of those, those things where it's various particle physics projects. And what we're really concerned with is, are the astrophysics ones. And I prefer this uh, diagram, which, uh, which shows the actual pictures of the uh, uh, existing, uh, sometimes existing and sometimes future uh, infrastructures that we're concerned, like the square kilometer array, like the joint, uh, like the, the um, VLBI network in Europe, the ELT, of course, planned for the future, ESO telescopes, including uh, ALMA that you see in the picture, the European Solar Telescope and the Chernkov Telescope. All right. Uh, in, on the particle physics side, uh, there's, there are projects like CERN and, and, and a project called FAIR, uh, but also the gravitational wave um, uh, partners for EGO and Virgo and cosmic ray neutrino uh, detector KN3Net. So ESCAPE was a big project that had many aspects to it. Um, I think I've got it, yeah, okay. So um, there is aspect about data storage with the data lake. There was a work package on science platforms for uh, processing data. There was a citizen science aspect to the project. There was a work package that built an open source software repository that is in operation. Uh, and there was the VO. So the VO part concerned uh, the things I've sort of already started to mention, interoperability of data, publishing data in a standard way so that it can be accessed, and what metadata and protocols are, are needed to make that, that work. Uh, so basically what I've just said, the virtual observatory part was to uh, uh, use the VO standards to make the data fair. And the idea was that we expanded from what had happened before to, to new partners. The solar telescope, for example, is completely new uh, uh, application of virtual observatory standards. It's fairly new for radio astronomy. And I would say that it's also high energy astrophysics concerning CTA is also a relatively new area in which um, uh, the standards were sort of uh, maturing, and we helped them mature during escape. Um, let me go fast through some of the objectives. Uh, um, these are the project level things that we were trying to do to, uh, oh yeah, let me, let me move on a bit and just say the approach that we took was to uh, combine the partners who already have expertise in building things like virtual observatory standards and tools, like ones from the CDS, but also from the University of Heidelberg and Spain and, uh, and, and in Italy, and combining those partners with the partners from the, the research infrastructures like ESO, SKA, JIVE, CTA, um, 
and putting those together in a way that enabled us to assess the needs of those infrastructures for VO standards and then to do some level of implementation. So the way we did that, we did it through having uh, um, technology forums. Uh, we did it by bringing those partners into the IVLA itself. And the key part, of course, was to implement, to develop, to prototype. Uh, each infrastructure was really at a different level of maturity. Um, so that needed to be taken into account. And then we also combined that development by making sure that those services were really usable and we took them to various training events where you know, early career researchers would come and uh, participate in schools for using that data. And then we also had training events for the, for the data providers themselves, where they would come and share the experience of how you know, what difficulties were they having to implement VO standards or what did they need from those VO standards? And I've really stolen some slides from those events to, to highlight the aspect of, uh, you know, learning from the other implementations. So one of the relatively mature implementations of VO standards is at the European Southern Observatory. They have uh, uh, an archive and they've, you know, we have documented the experience that they have had in adopting biotechnologies. And we're doing that so that we show what's possible. Other infrastructures can assess from that what is relevant for them. And really important, you know, we highlight what the strategies are for adoption and what are the difficulties. You know, it's not easy really. So what are the difficulties that come about? So uh, at ESO, for example, in addressing IVOA standards, they basically have a process where they define high level requirements. They selected which standards were necessary and they went through a process of implementation. So that's, that's a very simple thing to say, uh, but in, in the documented case, there's really a lot of detail about how they did that through anal analyzing the constraints, working out what evolution of their existing archive infrastructure would have to, have, have to happen, what database selections they needed to use, uh, what could be used off the shelf and what uh, did have to be built from scratch based on their needs, the cost, uh, and, and how to build that into their process at a big, in, at a big infrastructure like, like ESO. Uh, the example is, is fairly good because they have a successful uh, science portal with a web interface uh, that, where they integrate those VO aspects. They use a lot of existing tools, integrate them into their services, and as well as libraries. So they use tools like uh, ones that they might get from the CDS, but also libraries that are shared between different partners around the world for accessing and, and querying data models and building. Uh, building up their, their their services. I think what's really important on on in the ESO example is that they show how you can have alongside of the interactive web interfaces, you can have the programmatic tools and access. So they have um, uh, a lot of documentation about how you can query their services using ADQL. This language which is used for accessing tabular data. I mean, they do have an interactive way of using it on their website, but then you can use that programmatically as well. And they highlight which IDOA standards they use and then which, um, which software has been used to, to implement those. So I think for other research infrastructures, assessing how deeply, how much to use VOS tools and if it's useful for them, it's a really good example because they really highlight uh, what tools they have used uh, internally there. And of course, they provide feedback. And there was, a, you know, I don't want to hide from this in any way. They have a, a big assessment, which they call, you know, how bumpy was the road? Uh, and in some places, of course, it's a bit bumpy because uh, uh, it's not like, Implementing VO is just implementing a toolkit or, 
or something off the shelf. It usually requires adaptation to the real needs that you have there. You know, you have a certain kind of data. It has certain characteristics. It might be lots of small files. It may be a number of big things. It may be distributed in different ways. So I'm not going to go through their slide, but just highlight that uh, you can read there how, you know, what sort of issues they had to overcome. And some of them were to deal with, you know, the time it takes to build up expertise using those standards, because some of them are complex, and also understanding what the dependencies were, especially if you're in an operational environment and you need to implement something new, you need to really know what the dependencies are. Uh, the other example I want to highlight a, a little bit more quickly is, is uh, in radio astronomy from Jive. They were a relative newcomer to the virtual observatory where you know, uh, radio astronomy in the VR is, is in its early stages. And Jive comes with you know, lots of legacy data archives and in particular different types of data. And I've just directly stolen some of their slides presented at the escape events where we did this type of um, analysis. Uh, they defined what their VO protocol use cases were. For example, accessing the historic data, uh, which would then be used for high resolution follow-up with, uh, with the LBI. That related to gravitational waves, to, to uh, uh, gamma ray bursts, to uh, various things. And they wanted to have a standardized access to that archival data that you could use through science platforms. And they wanted to do that uh, through Jupyter Lab environment. And they really had to face the fact that the VLBI data is different to say the data that's from a classical spectrograph or from a, from a, uh, a, a optical survey done by ESO, for example. So it's visibility data. Uh, uh, the observation properties are less well defined. I mean, there are footprints uh, uh, and there can be multiple sources in a given data set. So part of the process there was discussing with the VO partners about how to get the metadata about that right. And then they evolved to being able to use the OBSTAP uh, uh, approach, which is for uh, exposing the tables of data in a standardized way using the OBSCore data model. And they used a lot of, uh, of this uh, standard called data link to link together the different components. They implemented it using tools such as the DACHS suite, D-A-C-H-S provided by Heidelberg, which enables them to expose their database uh, in like in the picture that you, you see there. There's, you know, um, uh, there's software in there that allowed them to ingest data, to, to, um, to integrate with their system. Uh, in particular, it's another case of a kind of layer because they say that they run on top of an existing archive. It's not like they rewrote the whole archive. It's like they put a video layer on top of that. They registered their service, which means they make and access it through the tools like, uh, like, uh, like Aladdin. And in summary, at the end of the escape project, they were able to say that, you know, the uh, European VLBI network data archive is more findable. Uh, the VO protocols were used to implement services that can access the access through the, the science platform. And they've had help from, from the partners in the project for, for doing that. So this is my overall sort of results table that we uh, that we produced for the escape work, where for each of the different infrastructures that were involved, these were the main uh, uh, results for helping them to use the VO. So for ESO, it was you know the VO standards in the archive, and well, basically using them as, as an example. For the gravitational wave, it was the development of the Mock 2.0 standard and the associated library that allows you to deal with that in Python called MockPy. Uh, for the radio astronomy, one of the biggest things there was really just getting radio astronomy going in the ivory way with the creation of an interest group there. I skipped to EST. I mean, they, they really faced for the first time how to describe the metadata about solar physics 
that they have. And then for high energy, for CTA and for KM3Net, there was a lot of effort put in the project about data provenance standards and for helping the implementation of those. So here I'm really referring to the work of uh, uh, Matthew Servia, uh, uh, and where there were uh, there's a reference paper published about that, and there were workshops held about uh, data provenance. And so I've taken a few slides from Matthew. Just I mean, it's not certainly not for me to lecture to this group about the high energy physics, but uh, clearly it's these you know these different types of astrophysics that you can access for in high energy experiments. Uh, CTA, of course, uh, is about detection of events, a uh, kind of indirect detection of the astrophysical source. I certainly won't lecture you on, on those, but I think we should, uh, as Matthew explains, recognize what is the complexity that comes with that. There are many telescopes. It's an indirect detection. There's a strong influence of the atmosphere and the state of your instruments. It's a transient sky that you're observing, and the, the data acquisition uh, involves a reconstruction, a detailed uh, uh, reduction of, of the data. And so at the IVOA level, or for, for VO and, and CTA, uh, I'm extracting here information from Matthew. I mean, the, the main thing is to be able to handle event lists uh, that are appropriate to what is observed or what will be observed with uh, CTA. There's a data discovery aspect where, you know, how do you describe the core elements of uh, observation uh, for a high energy event list? Uh, and what is the connection between the, date, the detailed data model that you will have in CTA to the standardized, more simplified data model that you would use in as an IVOA ops core? So these are some of the technical details that are being uh, addressed at the level of, like within the ESCAPE project, working out what are the observational core data model fields that are relevant to the CTA data. And here you get into very technical things, of course, about calibration level, about how you describe the coordinates and the regions. Uh, you know, how do we map the CTA versions onto the IVA version? Of course, there's uh, examples for services uh, like the HES data. This is just an example of using some of the services that are already there for accessing the tabular uh, data from, from HES and being able to display it in tools like, uh, like Topcat. And uh, one of the results of the escape work was to uh, really standardize based on you know, CTA uh, requirements, things for the provenance of the data. What happened to the data because it's such an important part of the, uh, the, the CTA pipeline and uh, processing to be able to capture that. So that was something that was brought in by the CTA project, uh, ask, you know, and working with partners like Observatory of Paris and CTAO to, um, to, to come to uh, the standardization necessary. And so, it's been quite a good success, actually, to, to have that standardized and to publish papers and, and have workshops about it. So I'm coming to the end now. Uh, um, you know, we do all of this so that our, our, you know, astronomers can use the data and do science with it. And in the ESCAPE project, we've, we've tried to foster that through the, the virtual observatory schools where people come and they bring their own projects. We support them before, during, and after the school. And I guess I'm highlighting that slide here because there's a whole lot of training materials. Uh, some of them are interactive, um, interactive tutorials that use tools like TopCat and Aladdin and, and the different services that are out there. But others of them are Python notebooks that can run in the escape platform. Uh, and integrate with the wider aspect of, of ESCAPE. So this is just a screenshot of what we've been doing in the last years, lots of virtual events uh, for training. Um, so in conclusion, I hope that I've shown you that the VO is a mature framework of standards for data sharing and interoperability in astronomy. The, 
the, the use of those standards has been supported by projects like ESCAPE, where we've brought the VO experts together with the partners from those experiments, from those large infrastructures. And I think that's really necessary because um, you need that combined expertise to, to make progress. Also, the people involved with developing you know, the archives and the data uh, servers of those instruments, it makes a big difference if they also participate in the standardization themselves. That way, the standards that are built are really relevant to what you need. So um, I encourage uh, really being involved in the IBA. And I think the use of examples of implementation are a valuable way to identify other in for infrastructures that are at different levels of maturity to work out what they should do based on the experience of others uh, and hopefully feedback themselves um, uh, um, their, uh, you know, what, they, what they've learned and what they achieved. And I, I, I have provided a whole set of references at the end of the talk with links to some of the information and notebooks and, um, and documentation. But I'll go back on the conclusion slide and, and uh, I'll finish uh, there. So thanks very much for your attention.